Hello, my name is Chris Schnee, and I write stories. Today I'd like to try a fantasy story. This one is called Strange Waters. A ship called the Edge of Brightness sailed the western sea in search of tainted waters. Irene stood in a broad, cautious stance on the deck, with both hands on the railing, as the ship cut and bounced its way along through the water. Can you swim? asked Justin. It seemed not to even tilt slightly when the ship wobbled. He'd been a sailor for all his young life, or so he claimed. Irene said, I'm starting to regret this trip. Justin laughed. Ah, you look a little green, but think of the profits you'll get to share. No more scrabbling for your research funding when you have your own supply of both money and whatever it is you're looking for out there. She said, I'm seeking matter touched by the elements, water specifically. Well, there's no shortage of that. Dangerous stuff, though, these tainted waters. Irene knew that very well. At great expense, she had stocked her safe, comfortable lab back home, which she was now regretting leaving, with samples of tainted fire and ice already. Why she'd bothered leaving the lab instead of hiring someone else to do this job was due to her seasickness, a question she kept asking. What have you studied already? asked Justin. Irene watched the horizon, which was enough to help calm her compared to watching the waves. She said, I had fire samples that had been focused on the concept that fire produces ash. Elementally touched by that concept, that aspect of what fire is, do you understand? That is, it was special fire that produced lots of ashes, but no light or heat, just a barely visible ripple in the air. Also, I had fire whose concept of consumption had gotten twisted. It was a strange fire that could burn stone, but not wood. I also have elemental ice that expresses the concept of being always bitterly cold. I have the variant that's just chilly, not frozen, yet it's solid, and it glows a soft blue. It acts as a nice torch. And I have ice that preserves the, that preserves food without actually being cold, expressing the concept of preserving things. Justin smiled. He'd gotten Irene to focus on lecturing instead of being seasick and sorry for herself. He said, You're in for a treat, then. We've come far enough toward the water elemental zones that we can get all kinds of special water for you. Dangerous, but hopefully interesting. We have heavy water, bright water, ever-swirling water, cleaning water, whatever we can find. Some of it's worth a pretty petty to the right buyer. Irene nodded. Her grip on the ship's railing loosened a little, making her notice that her knuckles ached. Good. I'd like samples of them all. There's invaluable research to do to understand why these things exist in the first place. Well, I can't guarantee anything. No telling what we'll find exactly. The sea provides, but what it gives us is pretty random. Hey, Captain, tell her about the monster crab. Monster, Irene said. The tattooed captain handed the wheel off to his son and stretched. He said, We were sailing on a stretch of sea like glass. Literally, it cracked as we broke through it. He thumped the hole. She's warred against most dangers, but it was still quite a noise. Suddenly, the biggest crab you've ever seen rears up at a clatter of shards and looms over the deck. He raised his arms like claws. Irene shuddered. What did you do? Wet himself, said Justin. Belay that. I ran for the harpoon, but no sooner had I turned around when the beast crashed down on deck in a tremendous spray of water and an inviting scent. The crab had gotten itself caught on a concept, you see, and changed. It was the concept that crabs are good eating, even smelled the butter. Irene's eyes were wide. That really happened? Of course it did, the captain said. So don't you worry. Have a rest and we'll find you some fancy water to take home. The sea never runs out of wonders. Irene nodded and headed toward her tiny cabin with a smile. It faded a bit when she heard Justin mutter behind him. Or horrors. She slept until late at night, when Justin knocked on her door. Miss, your talents might be helpful on deck. Irene woke suddenly, fearing something worse than the crab. There was an edge in the man's voice. When she got up to the chilly night air, though, nothing was attacking them. The moon was bright on the rippling sea. What is it? We've detected something, but we're not sure what. There was an edge to Justin's voice still, though the captain looked unflappable. He pointed to a gem that shined an eerie, rippling purple on the bow. Irene looked back and forth between it and the water ahead. The ship's sails had been furled to slow them to a crawl, and the captain kept glancing back toward the anchor as though he was considering stopping completely. She said, Of course, I'll get my instruments. She went below and came back with a brass case full of bees made of various special materials. They skittered about under the glass cover like ants, reacting to various sorts of magic in the waves. They settled down once Irene had tied the case securely to the bow. Yes, there's definitely element-tainted water here. 
How would you normally handle this with such an imprecise detector? She looked over at the magical compass. The captain said, It's not as bad as all that. A certain ripple means it's always pure water, the kind that, you know, can't be dirtied. And I've got the pattern for thin water burned into my heart. <sighs> thin? she said. Insubstantial. It doesn't support the weight of a ship that sails into it. The captain shivered. But this isn't that kind. Irene stared into her clacking beads. Half of the point of this expedition was to learn more about the device's behavior in the presence of strange elements, which meant that she didn't come here with a complete table of what every reading could possibly mean. These were, literally, uncharted waters. She said, I believe there are two different effects on the water ahead. I'd certainly like a sample, but not to... Well, how warded is this hole against strange elements? Sturdily, the captain said. But as with the thin water, not every effect is something that magic blocking wood helps against. I mean, judge the waves to be calm enough not to make her too queasy. She said, I'll take the dinghy. That's warded too, right? Good. Justin said, Are you sure, miss? We could sail a little closer and take samples with a long pole. He got a dirty look from the captain, who was already dropping anchor. He obviously didn't want to go ahead himself. Irene nodded. I won't be long, and will have a rope to reel me in if the boat fails for any reason. So, Irene climbed down a frightening rope ladder. How did sailors ever manage being up in a tall rigging? And in down into the dinghy. It was hardly big enough for herself, the oars, and her instruments. She pulled the oars of the dinghy herself, not minding how slowly she moved. Every minute she stared into the moonlit ocean, then into her box of spell analysis beads, and took more notes. She rowed leftward, a uh, port, as the sailors had called it, to see if she could circle around the anomaly and gauge its size. The water here wasn't visibly different on the starry night, just strange somehow that she couldn't see directly. The instruments pointed toward there being a fairly specific radius of whatever the strange effects were dead ahead. She circled around it some more, then edged closer and took up her sampling rod, which had a vial on one end. A dinghy rocked disturbingly side to side in the gentle waves. The beads clicked madly as she brought the water sample up and held it in one gloved hand. Irene studied the clicking, and her eyes went wide. There were two spell effects here on the water, but one of them was a known one. This particular patch of water had an effect saying, Water dissolves things. She was next to a patch of sea that was effectively a perfect acid, able to tear anything apart. She buttoned up her jacket with shaking fingers. Justin, she called out. From the ship seemingly a world away, he shouted back, What? What is it? She said, Dissolving. A pause. Get back here, ma'am. She had a duty to get this work done. She wasn't quite at the end of the tether rope's range, so she could go maybe a little farther and take one more sample slightly farther in. She had a duty to get this done. No, two more, maybe a trio of data points about the anomaly's edge versus its near center. She would kick herself forever she had only the one vial and never learn more. Though the sea had no humor, it had no pity either. A single errant wave was enough to make the dinghy rock suddenly from side to side. The next wave threw Irene overboard. She screamed, of course. The water tore into her, flowing around her mildly warded jacket and into her hands, into her failing legs. It felt like being sliced apart by frozen knives too small to see. They were shouting for the distant ship as her ears and face were being dissolved along with the rest of her. She sank. With failing eyesight, she looked at her hands, desperately paddling toward the dinghy. Her skin had drained of all color. She stopped sinking, and the freezing, slashing sensation had faded under her terror. Her jacket drifted right through her and away. She splashed up and forward to the surface, to the deck, and threw one arm over the boat's heaving side. Her arm wobbled and rippled, blue-tinged and translucent. Irene gave a burbling shout, feeling drowned and waterlogged, but she couldn't cough up the water. She flowed up onto the boat and lay there panting, and then realized that she flowed literally. Her clothes were gone, leaving only a mass of water in the shape of her flesh. She said, Water assumes the shape of its container. She'd been transformed. No, she was dead, and the mystic water had copied her, even in the process of dissolving her. Or something in between. Some half-reality. Her hands were made of water. They were constantly dripping, yet they were maintaining their rough shape. She stared at them, and at the fingers and nails resolved more sharply. Her chest, too, had become a nearly identical copy of her old one when she looked closely, though with the loss of attention... Her hands became more like a rough-hewn and melting ice sculpture. She couldn't keep herself entirely solid all at once. She leaned over the boat's side and saw her reflected face, made of water too. Her body had the suggestion of wet hair trailing down her back. 
if it was a copy or a Watt original or something else, something like it. Samples. She needed her samples to understand. Where was the pole? Washed away. The vials? Her samples? Still in a holder that she'd secured next to her instrument. Irene busied herself with the clicking beads and stuck vials into the sea with her bare hands now, collecting the three that she'd wanted and then five more. She needed hard data. She needed to understand. The tow rope was hauling the dinghy back now. Irene turned round, less rotating than simply making her front and rear sides reverse. The captain and Justin were hollering and pulling her back. We've got you, they said. Don't worry. Irene collapsed into the boat's hull with her head on her hands, splashing everywhere. When they grabbed the dinghy, Justin said, Miss, what happened? Irene worried that she'd lose control over her body completely and turn into a puddle and nothing more. She said, Changed by the water, or replaced. I don't know. I have samples. What's going on? She held out the vials. They bobbed in her hand as though they were floating at the surface of a pond. You kept taking measurements, Justin said. Are you safe to touch? It was a good question. Irene turned her measurement device around to focus on herself. The clicking was still there as the device reacted to her, but she reported, It says, magically tainted, but without the specific effects of my samples. I'm water. Justin was still above her, leaning down from the rope ladder. He approached and tapped her flowing hair with the tip of one pinky finger. He waited, shook the water off, and said, All right, here. He offered his hand to help her back on deck. They got herself and her equipment back aboard. The captain held out a blanket, then hesitated. Irene took it to see what would happen. When she concentrated on being nearly solid, she could drape the blanket across her shoulders and have it behave nearly as though it rested on real flesh. She said, I, I need to lie down, I think. My samples... She waved vaguely toward her equipment. We'll take care of them, said Justin. We'll figure this out. Don't worry, ma'am. Irene nodded dumbly and went back to her cabin, as though nothing was wrong. As though she hadn't just died, or, or something. She felt parts of herself splashing into and through the bunk, shuddered, and pulled herself together again. Could she even sleep safely? She was so busy forcing herself to run through all the equations and the laws of magic she knew that she forgot to stay awake. The captain's son looked fearfully at her and brandished a tin plate of biscuits and wilted cabbage. I, I don't believe it, still. Irene was still waking up, becoming aware of the constant sense of herself flowing and rippling inside. I'm not sure I do, either. She took one of the biscuits and tried to eat it, but had no true throat or teeth to chew and swallow with. The thing only floated disgustingly where her jaw should be. She shuddered and yanked the wet dough out. You can't eat, said the young man. Then she had to be powered by magic, didn't she? She was an elemental of sorts. Water, she said. Bring me water. The man backed away, but returned with a mug of drinking water, the ordinary kind, in his unsteady hand. He held it out as far away as he could in front of him. Irene took it, tried to give him a reassuring smile, and poured some of the mug into her mouth. The water seemed to vanish, or to merge with her. The same thing happened when she poured it into her, into her hand instead. Now, if the stories of elementals were true... Irene held up one hand, palm up, and concentrated. A bead of water flowed up from her body and hovered, forming a glob a few inches above her hand. She flung it at the cabin wall. The captain's son yelped and fled. Irene crouched beside the wet planks and willed the moisture to flow back into her, which it did. The process was disturbingly intuitive. The captain and Justin appeared next in the cabin doorway. "'Are oh, you all right?' said Justin. "'I think so. I need, I need to study this more.' She could gather more information, learn more, keep herself busy investigating. He brushed past the two, trying not to think about how she consorted herself to pass between them, and she dived into the sea. She was part of it. She could let some of it flow through her or around, and when she tried, she rose up on a pillar of water that enveloped her lower half like a mermaid's tail. It was just as much at her command. Her senses spread out across a broad stretch of water around and beneath the ship. She rippled under the hull and inspected it, prying off barnacles as though she was chiseling at their edges with tiny jets of water. It was several minutes of exploration before she noticed that she hadn't breathed at all. Irene surfaced again to meet the eyes of the astonished captain and said, I'm all right, I think. She would have to be, whatever she was now. There were advantages to this new shape, much to learn. She'd focus on them and on her studies and everything she could learn from both. After all, she may have taken on yet another property from the water. Water flows around obstacles, after all. That was the story, Strange Waters. Before we go, I'd like to read another piece that's only a hundred words long, just a silly little thing. It's called Fafnung. Here we go. 
The dragon Fafnung lay atop his shining horde, bewildered. He had burned knights, devoured thieves, but ages had marched on. Today's intruders had come boldly and struck so cunningly that they took gold and lived. His indomitable will had broken against the tiny mortal's gaze. Clad in green, they had shown no fear, and he had felt compelled to give them more than they demanded, in return for a far lesser gift. Fafnung sliced open their offering with one claw and devoured it, snorting in surprise. He would not burn anyone's village today. In the intruder's defense, the thin mints were pretty good. Okay, that's it for today. The story Strange Waters is part of a collection of mine called Mythic Transformations, which is on Amazon. That one's all about people being transformed in some way into mythical creatures, like griffins, dragons, and one of those fantasy dungeons the heroes are always exploring. The dragon-slash-wolf stories in that one are linked, and they scare me to this day. There's also some just plain silly stuff in there, including an obligatory zombie piece. Thanks for listening, all. Until next time. <laughs>